Well, welcome everybody to our webinar. Um, this webinar is Adding Value as a Technical Communicator. It is a webinar from the Instructional Design and Learning SIG. And today we are going to hear from Ed Marsh. Now, I saw this presentation as part of Conduit last year, and I really got a lot out of it. Um, Ed is a smart technical communicator, and he knows how to communicate that to others. And um, Ed does a, a lot of wonderful things in the tech comm world. He is a senior member of STC. He's active in the New York Metro chapter, and he created his content content po podcast, which if you haven't subscribed to it on um, whatever uh, podcast app you listen to, I would encourage you to do that. Um, his, his podcasts are warm, but also informative. Um, Ted, uh, Ed is a very good interviewer. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Ed, and I'm going to keep an eye on the chat window for you. Wow, warm and informative. That's uh, yeah. I'll take that. Thank you, Vicki. That's yeah. really nice to hear. Um, so, uh, I think the next week or so. in and hear me rant and rave. Um, I hope you get a lot out of it. I know it was a uh, pretty successful. So please, you know, I always encourage interactivity in my in my in microphone access. Uh, if you don't have uh, the ability to use a microphone if you're in an open office or something like that. Uh, feel free to use the chat, but please, you know, ask questions. I cut this down a little number of slides, so that way uh, I'm not rushing and we can take some time to uh, to talk and really ask questions. So, um, yeah, without further ado, um, you know, well, let's start. Um, so I guess we should say, why are we here? And why why am I telling you uh, what you should do to be a better technical communicator? Um, I've been involved in, in the activity or the profession for uh, over 25 years now. Um, I've had three jobs over those 25 years because quite simply, uh, I've, I've added value each time. Uh, my last two positions, I started as consultants and converted over the full time. Um, so, you know, they obviously saw the value of keeping me on in, in their organizations. Uh, I work at a small firm now called Goldman Sachs that you may have heard of. Uh, I've been there for <laughs> over eight years now. Um, and as Vicki mentioned, I'm a senior member uh, of the Society for Technical Communication. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at um, Summit this year coming up soon. Uh, Vicki also mentioned the podcast. It's something I started uh, and I can't believe it. It's just about five years ago. Um, and it's, you know, it's ongoing. I, I, I would like to say it's monthly, but it's about bi-monthly or, or, you know, so hope, hoping to change that in 2020, uh, but hope you listen and subscribe. Um, and of course, uh, content content.info is a bit old and a bit not attractive anymore, but it is an aggregator of different um, blogs and resources for technical communicators, uh, UX designers, content strategists, stuff like that. So um, I got sick of basically going to all these different sites and made one so that I could go to all myself. Um, and basically, um, you could find me on Twitter at Ed Marsh. Uh, and I'm pretty, I'm really active there, I should say that. Um, how do I minimize this real quick? Okay, there we go. Okay, so first thing, you know, I want to mention to you is, you know, be confident in yourself and be confident in your skills. Um, you know, before you start any of this, um, you know, you're obviously, as a technical communicator, you're not always high visibility. Um, and what, yeah, you know, what I've learned being in a humongous organization like Goldman Sachs with 36, 37,000 people, uh, you have to take career uh, responsibility for your own career. Uh, some people will help you, but you have to really, you know, take your career, you know, in your hands and, and do something with it. So uh, the first thing I would like to talk to you about is uh, marketing and self-promotion and how to do this. Uh, some things that I've done that's been uh, successful and, um, you know, it's something that you can uh, easily take on to prove the value of what we do as a, as a, as a person and as technical communicators. Um, okay, let me do this next. Next. There we go. Okay. So first thing, you know, empower yourself. You're, we're more than just writers. I think people think that we sit there with our heads down all day um, and just write words and make sure that the language is perfect and stuff like that. And, you know, I think 
we we kind of take that it to heart a little bit, uh, especially because many of us are um, indeed somewhat introverted. So you know, you're more than just a writer. I think that's you know first thing to do is stand up and say, hey. I just don't take words and make your words look pretty or sound nice or translatable. Uh, we do a lot more for the for the firm. Um, and one really good way to do this is uh, newsletters. And this is something that surprised the hell out of me, quite honestly, because it was, just, you know, in a very, very large firm, there are lots of people get lots of emails every day. And you don't always have the time to go through everything, but we started, we noticed we started doing this. We started sharing some statistics, some metrics about uh, the highly hit topics, stuff like that. We were telling people about new topics. Um, and of course, we we're telling them the value of what we do and saying, you know, for example, if you're in a financial in the financial world, you have to deal with year end statements. We made a an aggregation of year end topics. So that way people go to one place and they're all the year end related information. If there's something they don't go to frequently or something they can access really quickly, uh, we put that there. So things like that, just simple advertisements, taking those wins uh, and letting people know about it other than the people on your team or the people that you uh, immediately work with and other teams, it really makes a difference. And um, Vicky, if I remember correctly, uh, you mentioned you were doing something along these lines at your organization as a result of this talk. Yeah, this was my big walking away um, hooray from the when, the time that I saw you in Conduit. What? So we wanted to start a, a newsletter here um, but there's right now a freeze on um, a freeze on uh, adding more kinds of communicating because our branding people are kind of trying to take inventory of all the ways that we communicate and we, they didn't want us to start a new one. So what we started to do is instead of using email, we now use Yammer. Yammer's a uh, uh, enterprise social media site. And so the same things that I was going to do the information I, was, I wanted to share in the newsletter, I now share on Yammer, and um, it's we're getting a lot of eyeballs and um, getting uh, sort of raising our brand <clears throat> as communicators. And um, I really just thank you for this tip. It's really great. Thank you. Yeah. And a nice thing, too, is that, you know, we could see on the days that we release our newsletter the day after, um, we actually do get a significant bump in our metrics, our on-page metrics, um, when we when we release it. They're usually the highest uh, of the month, believe it or not. Uh, and people, we find, you know, obviously that people are clicking the links uh, that, uh, that, you know, that we're, we're advertising. Mm -hmm. So it really makes a big difference. It was, uh, you know, it really, it really does work. And I think one of the things... Um, you know, this next slide will tell you, give you kind of a help, hopefully, on, you know, what you could do with that newsletter and how you can actually, you know, prove that value in the newsletter and, of course, beyond, where uh, I love this acronym. It's something I've heard a while ago, uh, and I keep using it because it's so apropos for what we do, um, even in customer service or as technical communicators, you know, what's in it for me? Why do I care? Um, you know, what is in it for the person who's reading your content, whether it's your, your technical content, your newsletter, your marketing materials, whatever. So certainly think about your user and, you know, give that, give yourself that question. Even when you're starting to write a topic or starting to write a new manual or whatever, what's in it for me, comma, the user? You know, questions like, why does this matter to me? What is it? How does it help me do my job? Um, how much of my bandwidth does this take? Is it going to take me a long time to find the information? Is it going to take me a long time to read the information? How do I get, you know, in and out of your help system or your documentation as quickly as possible? Um, what are the benefits to my team and to the entire company? You know, um, what are the costs and risks? And we'll talk about risks uh, towards the end of this session. Uh, it's a really a whole topic to itself, but uh, we could touch on that briefly today. Um, you know, and then of course, how many resources does this require from us or how many resources does it alleviate? These are things to think about, especially some of the ways that managers will think or people who don't have a ton of time in their day. Why am I coming and taking time out of my day to come and, and hit your content? Is it because I have nothing better to do with my day? Probably not. So, um, you know, Take that in mind when you're um, when you're putting together your information and uh, and writing some content. I'm going to pause here for a second. Ask if anybody has any questions in the chat or uh, online about that. Um, is there any questions you have so far about anything? So I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, will you share your slides with us? Oh, absolutely. Okay, great. Yes, yes, that's a, that's an easy answer. So yes. Thank you very much. 
Anybody else? Okay. All right. I'll move on then. So the next section I want to talk about is PDFs. Um, I have a, I have a pet peeve for PDFs. I don't know why. Um, I just don't like PDFs, and I don't like that. Um, I know that, um, but for various reasons, I really don't like PDFs. And the first one is really this: the only metric you can get from the number of downloads you have. You don't know if. using to kind of do that um, I you know there's only it's very hard to justify value to management when the only metric that you have is oh we have 500 downloads next month or this month um, <clears throat> you know it doesn't really give your any actionable information to the um, you know actionable information to your your support teams uh, so really if you can and I understand that lots of people can't um, you know please Put your list, your stuff online, even if it's behind a firewall. Uh, it's easier and better for just about everybody, including uh, for accessibility purposes. A um, couple of other things to think about. Um, you know, version control, like Git, doesn't really work well at PDFs. Uh, this is something we're actually uh, looking into now. We're going to move to uh, a GitLab repository, which is a um, an online version control system, uh, and we're moving away from SVN. And my teammate told me, oh, I'm, um, all your binaries and stuff like PDFs and screenshots and stuff like that, they don't go into a GitLab. They don't work well with that. So you have to kind of find another place for that information or that someplace to, for that stuff to reside. Uh, so that's a consideration if you're in that environment. Um, if you've ever tried to download a menu from a, a restaurant on your phone, uh, and you get something that looks like this and you've got to pinch and rotate your phone and this that, and the other thing it's you know i find that an interminably difficult uh situation to be in i just hate it and i just wish that people would think about that as you know as as we move forward um and you don't know you know are your people accessing your content on your on their phones or um you know is there someone at a job site that wants to pinch in to zoom on an ipad to see a part number um you know that you put it into a PDF. You know, it's, there's so much that you could do outside of PDF in the HTML world that you can accommodate a lot of these things. Um, and it really, you know, it really improves search because people are using the words, um, you know, that they use, and you could see what they are using, stuff like that. So, you know, I think that's obviously consider what your users are thinking about um, and how they use this stuff. But again, what's in it for me is the PDF the best. Um, possible way for them to access this information. And, you know, again, along the lines of what's in it for me, just because a spec requires a PDF, it doesn't necessarily mean that your users want it. If you could build it in, you know, maybe give them a HTML output as well. Um, maybe it's a value add. I don't know how that all would work for your organization, but, you know, maybe ask them, ask them how they would prefer it. And if they like PDFs, then, you know, you've got your answer right there. Okay. Okay. And this leads into embracing data driven content. I talked a lot about metrics and really, you know, a lot of that is um, what managers want to know and senior managers want to know and senior senior managers want to know, um, you know, they want to know metrics. They don't really care how many words you write per day. You know, they really don't care. Um, you know, if you're, if everything's grammatically correct, they care that their users or their employees are really getting the information they need at the time that they need it. So, you know, like I said, PDFs, the only metric you have is a download. This gives you so many more ways to do it. And there's so many tools out there now that are open source, that are free, um, that are supported in the dev community, um, that it's really pretty easy to implement this kind of stuff. So really, you know, the first thing um, to really think about is find out how your users write and think. Like I said, with a PDF, if they're searching, you don't know what they're searching for, if they're finding it, or the term that was in the index was a term that they want to use. Um, you know, are you speaking that language? Are you speaking the language of your users? Um, are you considering misspellings and typos? This is an interesting thing is that uh, we have a support ticket system at work, uh, and we found out that um, there is a, a rule called the Volcker rule 
Um, and people were misspelling the word Volker, so they weren't getting any results in our online help system. So what we did is we basically implemented some hidden keywords on our HTML pages and made them hidden so that way they were like white on white, uh, but that way they were visible. So if you misspelled Volker, if you missed the K or you missed the C or you didn't know there was a C and a K in there, um, you would at least get some results so that way it would pro uh, potentially prevent people from raising that support ticket and just to find out, oh, Volker is, is you know, and then the support person would say, oh, the link is here because they would know how to search for Volker. So, you know, that saves some money and it saves a bunch of people a, a time. And again, you know, additional keywords you can add. Metadata is really, really important, um, <clears throat> you know, and um, follow up on an interesting ticket. It's, you know, um, I, you know, so really, you could generate new topics from there. Think about you know what people are looking for and say, oh, okay, we need an aggregation of topics for this time period or you know this sales period or things along those lines. So you know think about ways that you can use that support ticket and add value, not just um, you know kind of reporting on it. Um, you know again, help your technical support teams. Uh, these these folks should be your friends. Um, you know you can. Are the you know are they getting questions at the, at the same time all the time? You know I've gotten lots of people who say uh, people call me up and ask me this question all the time. Can I just have a topic um, where we can just point them to? And people love that stuff. So um, you know then you could also share best practices amongst them, and they can share best practices with you. Uh, we have a, a support team in Bangalore who we interact with once a month, and uh, it's really really a great uh, great relationship. Um, you know, plus you're on the same team. You know, you're you're both trying to support people, so you've got lots of war stories and best practices to share. Um, and of course, our job is to create connections and break down silos. This is a perfect way to do that. You know, get out there, get those metrics. Say, hey, we see that you're, you know, you're having a problem with this, or that your team is um, having a problem with this, or visiting this topic frequently. Is this something that you, as a manager, can go back and train your teams, or tell them, you know, more information or things like that to to help those managers help their 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 uh, reports. Any questions about that? Anything anyone want to add? Okay, so I have to apologize for Ginny Reddish, um, but I'm telling you, let go of the words. Um, you know, we really are writers, and I know a lot of people are really, you know, very, they think the writing is a very important part of it, and of course it is, but sometimes I think we let esoteric debates um, get in the way of actual productivity. So, you know, I love this definition of content strategy by Ann Rockley, um, the right information to the right, uh, delivered to the right person for the right reason at the right time. And every time I go to work and I think about this or create new information, I think about this because really, you know, it goes back to what's in it for me. So, you know, are you speaking in your user's language? Are you, you know, are you creating silos by having that stuff in a PDF where they need it in an HTML or they need it in a Word doc, stuff like that? Um, you know, make sure that the information that you have and that you're creating is accessible to everybody when they need it, where they need it. Um, <clears throat> this is something that came up at the uh, at the conduit session a couple of years ago. I think he was a, a keynote speaker, and really he asked you, are you writing for your peers or your audience? And that's something, you know, what's in it for me? Are you writing for them? Are you writing for you? Um, you know, are you using words that they use or kind of slang that they would use, um, you know, or, you know, the way that they would they would talk or the way that they would search, I think is the most important thing, especially in an online world uh, where everything is exposed to the web. What are they searching for? Are they using, are you, they using the words that you expect them to use? Um, you know, and I would say in terms of arcane issues or, or language issues, just be consistent. I, I choose something and be consistent. I think that's what people look for more than perfect English and perfect grammar all the time is just consistency. I mean, even if it's consistently bad, at least it's consistent. Um, and I strive for that, you know, consistency across everything uh, as much as possible. Uh, so, you know, it's 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 obviously a choice and there's choices you need to make. But, um, you know, the number of words that you write are not a measure of success. Um, people don't really care. And, uh, you know, delivery and engagement is really what's important now. And I think that's where uh, the value could be really added is not taking a long time to get that content together and perfect, but to get it out there and have it measurable.
Okay. The other thing is, don't call everything an FAQ. I was just talking to a colleague at work earlier today um, and said, you know, basically when I onboarded to the, to the firm, there was a page with 250 FAQs that all started with FAQ. Some of them said, oh, we don't have an answer to this. Some of them said, actually, for the answer to this, go to this topic. Um, and it's just really, really annoying in several ways. I mean, it drove traffic to that, that particular page. That was basically the number one hit page, but then everyone had to scroll through 250 FAQs to kind of find what they were looking for. Um, obviously, it's not great for search or SEO. Um, and the other question is too, I mean, how many times are frequently asked question actually frequently asked? So that's just something to consider too. Um, and one thing I have experienced though is you're gonna expect pushback from clients. People are gonna wanna use FAQs. It's a, it's a obviously well-known word. It's used all over the web, but you know, choose your battles. And if you can, just, just avoid them as much as possible. If you need them, get the metrics, go and review them. And that way you could say, yeah, actually this is, um, this is a frequently asked question, or you can go back to your reporting and um, you know, go back to your reports and say, yeah, this topic is useful or no, let's, let's archive it. And it looks like Marcia is saying, uh, they are usually more don't ask questions. I agree. So, <laughs> so yeah, you know, again, know your users, know what they're looking for. Um, and if they're looking for FAQs, use it. If, you know, if someone clients are saying, yes, we want FAQs, you know, choose your battles, choose, you know, get the wins where you can and then promote them. Again, okay, so another one for me, I've always embraced the technical and technical writing. Um, you know, I'm the kind of person who pushes buttons to see what they do. Um, so I would say really, you know, if you have some time, especially in the world now where it is where we're on the web and there's lots and lots of, uh, you know, tutorials out there, there's lots of videos. Uh, YouTube is an absolutely wonderful place to learn all kinds of things. Uh, if you're in the DITA world, Oxygen XML has some really great YouTube channel with some really good videos. Um, but really, you know, <clears throat> learn some coding basics. I think, um, you know, we should all learn some coding stuff in, in 2020. Uh, from what I understand, even kids in, in school are learning HTML and CSS. Uh, JavaScript is, is pretty much the language of the web now, um, you know, the programming language of the web. If you can learn some of that and consider, you know, inputting some of that into your online help systems to add some activity, some add a like, something along those lines, um, you know, that would really help everybody. And because, you know, if you're in the online help world, Flare, Flare Maker, RoboHelp, RoboHelp Output, they're all HTML and CSS. So if you can go in there and maybe clean some of the mess out of there or understand what's going on with your outputs, you know, that's another value add. If you can do and some, learn some of the coding on your team and if they're having problems with outputs, instead of having to go to a developer and get from help, you could do that in-house, save a lot of time, and then you can educate everybody else how to, how to do stuff like that. Um, another interesting thing about CSS is that in a lot of these authoring tools, it's really used to style the, AA, the PDF output now. So if you want the PDF to look different than the standard output, you know, that's another way you could do it. I think Flare does it. I think RoboHub does along those ways. Um, so, and I certainly Oxygen does with Dita. So uh, really, you know, if, it's, if you learn CSS, that gives you value in, in two kinds of ways, PDF and online help. Um, you know, there's also, plenty of resources out there. Like I mentioned, uh, Stack Overflow is a site, I think it's stackoverflow.com, where you go and um, developers ask questions about everything and esoteric stuff, lots of stuff about HTML, um, basically any kind of coding question out there, you could go there and get question, you know, questions and answers. There's stuff on DITA, there's stuff on XSLT. Um, there's a bunch of stuff out there like that. So really having that, that wide diversity of of uh, knowledge is really gonna be helpful, especially if your output is, is, is going to online. Come on, there we go. Uh, so the other thing that goes, goes in the line too is um, Docsys code where you're using um, the same tools you do developers do. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, a complete stack where you're using exactly everything developers do, but you can use a lot of that that whole chain that they do. And of course it is a lot, pretty widely supported around the world. I'm talking about things like version control, Git, GitHub, GitLab, SVN, uh, Microsoft Team Foundation Server, I think is what that's called. I forget the, the acronym, but those are all your version control systems. And you know, developers in your firm are probably using one of these. 
um, Slack or something like it. I know Vicky says uh, they use Yammer or something like Microsoft Link. Um, they're all the kind of sim they're all the kind of similar, um, <clears throat> you know, similar instant communication formats. Um, if you use Slack or you don't know much about Slack, um, it's another one of those uh, free applications where you sign up for different teams or different chats. Uh, there's things out there for STC. There's things for content strategy. Um, Sarah Walker Betcher has a ethical content one. Um, so really, if that's something that you think you want to get interested in or maybe implement or learn before you could take that to work and get involved in the community there, it might be something to, uh, to look into. We have a chat here question. Uh, oh, Microsoft uses Azure DevOps now. We use that with Teams. OK. That's it. OK, so there you go. Oh, so, so is that you're on a tech writing team in Microsoft. Cool. OK. Um, something else, text editor for simple stuff. If you're in Markdown, uh, you're probably familiar with a lot of these text editors. Uh, one I use is called VS Code or Visual. Oh, oh we just use their tools. OK. OK, thanks, Suzette. Um, but Visual Studio Code is a great one. I really, really like it for a lot of things. Uh, VI is a classic Unix one. I just put it in there because it's old. Uh, Atom, Sublime Text, these are all some pretty fancy text editors or coding editors that you could do a lot with HTML or XML or Ditto or stuff like that. Um, I use that for a lot of things that I don't want to do in Oxygen or it's easier to do in a dedicated code editor, uh, things like multiple search and replace, a lot of different things that is sometimes it's just easier to use that code editor or uh, instead of a full blown application. Uh, also that they work really, really nicely with Markdown if, if you're in the unstructured language like Markdown, ASCII doc restructured text. They all have lots of support in VS Code. Uh, I find it's really the best environment to use uh, to write Markdown because there's a lot of tools. There's even some grammar tools that you can use in VS Code. Uh, I'm sure Adam and Sublime Text have a lot of support for that as well. I believe they're all free, uh, open source, well-supported tools. Um, of course, if you're, like I said, if you're in the Markdown world, um, these code editors are probably something you're going to be involved with uh, because developers really, really seem to like Markdown. Um, but the good news is Oxygen XML editor has really good MD uh, Markdown tools. Uh, it's got an inline editor. You can actually convert your your um, <clears throat> your your Markdown to Ditta. And I don't want to make this sound like a a, a um, promotion for Oxygen and ad for Oxygen, but it's just a tool I'm really happy with and really familiar with. So I know that it has these abilities. Um, but I can encourage you, these are all free, these text editors, Slack's free. All of this information is free. Uh, GitLab and Git have pretty good documentation out there. You know, if you have some free time at work or you have some free time at home, you know, take a look into this. It adds value and it gives, you know, and it really just increases your tool set and your, you know, your, your, your value. And if you can, God, this is a huge one for us. Uh, learn and implement structured content. It doesn't have to be Ditto. It, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can do structured content now. Um, metadata is a really big thing, um, especially in that world of Markdown. Um, Markdown isn't always pretty, but we're looking to move to a solution that kind of uses HTML or Markdown as an output. So I'm learning that world a little bit. And metadata is as important there as it is in the data world. So that's really something to think about um, you know, as you're going forward. And if you have time to re-architect everything or move yourself to an HTML output, you know, that's a really good time and an opportunity to add that value and make your life easier and make your user's life easier. So here's an example of metadata. This is kind of, um, excuse me one second. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little dry. Um, you know, metadata is really important and um, for lots of different ways. And I'm learning about it more as we're moving to a new system uh, to use more metadata more and more in different ways. So this is a, a really weird example, but I'm an IndyCar and motorsports fan. Uh, so it was something that stuck out to me. Um, if you look here, and this is from YouTube TV, which is Google's TV, online TV offering. Um, if you look and you see Formula One, WeatherTech, Sports Car, Campus, who really cares? But the interesting thing is below that for me. It's four recent games this week and two recent games this week. Well, I don't know if anybody knows much about racing, but um, there's races. There aren't games. So it was just something that stood out to me as, hey, you know, if someone was smart with their metadata and knew what it was, they would say two recent races or two recent recordings this week even because there's only one race. So for me, that's, you know, it's just a simple thing that says, hey, someone wasn't paying attention to how the metadata works and just put something in there hard coded probably. But it also says to me too that, 
big companies can get it wrong too. So, you know, just think about that when you go away and think about how you can add value or certain things. You may not be able to do it all, but, you know, YouTube and Google are kind of doing it too. So, so take some heart. Okay. The next thing, of course, this is something I've talked about frequently. Um, if you're not online, I, I, you know, especially if you're a consultant or a contingent worker, I don't, you know, you, you don't really exist to people. So if your people are looking for a job, for looking for, uh, for a technical writer, a technical communicator, or whatever it is you do, e-learning specialist, um, you really have to be out there and, um, you know, also think about it as part of your content strategy. You know, is, is social media part of your content strategy? Is there someplace, something that you and your team can do to get involved with the social media and help your team, help your company, help your users out? So, you know, of course, what you what you can do on social media, and I'm going to talk about pretty much Twitter and Facebook because those are where I live, and I know uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of technical communicators are on Twitter. Uh, I do have a Twitter list that curates uh, several hundred technical communicators. Um, so, if you're interested in that, let me know. Um, but there are literally hundreds of technical communicators out there, content strategists, you know, all flavors of people who work in our world. They're out there doing lots and lots of good stuff. Um, but of course. It allows you to promote your team and product, but of course that has to be done correctly. So that's where someone like a social media consultant or someone in your firm that, that leads that up is person to reach out to initially before you go out there. Cause I'm sure if you're on Twitter, you've seen some really, really bad branding fails. Um, it also allows you to do some research. Like we said before with metrics, what are your consumers doing or thinking? Uh, what are their pain points? They're probably reaching out to your company's Twitter account because they have some sort of problem or question. Uh, you can also use Twitter for opposition research. What are your compete? Sorry, competitors doing? Um, you know, what are other companies in your area doing? What are people in your, uh, you know, in your your company, your area, your competitors, your region, wherever your team, your company competes? What are, where are they doing? What are they doing? Um, it's also a great place to crowdsource information. You can ask questions about, hey, my application is crashing. Does anybody have a, a data resource for this? Do you know something about? Um, X or Y, what's the best practice here? Um, and of course, and to add value, you can go back and answer those questions too. And really, I've met a lot, a lot of people on Twitter that I've got met, um, sorry, I've met a lot of people on Twitter and then met them at conferences and it's, it's like you already know them already. So it's not like you're going there cold or not knowing anybody when you go to a new conference. Um, you already know somebody, you already ha look, have people to look forward to meeting and, and meeting in person for their first time. And I find that really, really exciting. Um, so, you know, make sure you go out there and, and put yourself out there, uh, of course, within your company's guidelines. Um, you know, of course, it's also a great place for news, Twitter especially. Um, you know, breaking news is always on Twitter, uh, industry news, and of course, conference coverage. There's lots and lots of people who go to different conferences all over the world that might be adjacent to what you do or something in your industry um, where you could just follow them. And they're, they're basically live tweeting a conference. Some of them might be you know, might be live um, live videoing it, um, but it's a great place to get to conferences and get information that you normally wouldn't be able to for whatever reason. Um, industry thought leaders, Karen McGrain, um, you know, Sarah Walker Betcher, lots and lots of people in our field are on Twitter and they're really getting out there. And it's, um, you know, some of them have really great Twitter accounts. A lot of people are adding value, um, you know, and they're making themselves leaders by being on Twitter and getting that, getting the word out there that they know something. Um, two hashtags I would recommend on uh, Twitter are TechCom and Content Strategy. TechCom seems to be a big one in our field. Most of the tweets that I've seen usually have hashtag TechCom in there. Any questions about social media? Anything else that you uh, have any questions? Burning questions. So Vicki has a question. Vicki. Will you uh, also share your Twitter list with us? Yes, I could do that. Um, do you have an email that a distro you can send it to? I'll send it to you and then you can send it out. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, um, we have the email address of everybody who signed up today. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, if you go to Ed Marsh or sorry, twitter.com slash Ed Marsh. And I think if you click on the lists one, it should be tech dash writers or tech writers. Um, but certainly we can send a link out and there, like I said, I keep, I keep adding more and more people. Uh, and it's great because there's, you know, lots of people I'd never heard of people from all around the world. Um, so it's, I have to say it's a heck of a lot of fun. Well, and you're uh, the, 
you're the content content guy, right? You you yeah. look for content about content, which uh, yes really helps the rest of us out. So thanks. There you go. That's another way to add value. No, I don't want to leave the meeting. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> no, uh, please don't. <laughs> no, I just I just clicked the wrong thing. It's like do you want to exit? I'm like nope, nope, nope. Sorry. Um, okay. All right. So just a few more slides left. Um, you know, this is something that that drives me kind of crazy too. Um, just remember that it's 2020. Design matters. Um, and the reason I put these two screenshots up here, you look on the left hand side, this is Oracle's virtual box. It's a virtual machine that you could run on Windows to run different operating systems. And it looks like it's kind of it's it's looks like it's a chum file or web help chum file. Um, and on the right hand side is a web based online help center uh, for Java documentation. Um, now, I don't know if you know anything about either of these tools, but I could tell you this, these two both tools are these online health systems are both tools from the same company and they're both being released in 2019 and 2020 if it were up to you which one would you rather which which one would you rather use and which one would you rather interact with which one looks friendlier to you i'm 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 pretty sure you know the answer that i would have but think about that you know when you're you know when you're talking about design or talking about um you know things that you could do with your with your company or your firm to make it more attractive. You know, you, you think about that, and it's easier to do this with CSS than it is with. Huh, thanks, Darcy. Um, uh, she's messing with us, I think. Okay, I hope so. But that's you know, opinion. You know, design is is opinion. But I you know personally, if you look at most websites, even if you're going to a website to do some shopping, Amazon doesn't have a humongously great user experience all the time. If everyone goes there because everyone's there, but I think. Um, you know, I you know, I think you could I go to some sites because they're more useful or more attractive than others. Um, so yeah, I mean, Tim has a comment. Uh, someone who works at Oracle, it's hard for the company to change over technology for every acquisition. I agree with you. I agree with you. I just these were two things that I had noticed. Um, you know, that was like, hey, these are the same company, and obviously, with a company as large and diverse as Oracle, that you know, that gets larger by acquisition, largely, um, you can't cover every every use case. But I, you know. My point is quite simply this, if you had a choice, which one would you rather interact with? So that's something to consider, you know, and a way to say, hey, you know, maybe we're, maybe we would get more hits, boss, if our stuff was a little bit nice looking, you know, so, um, you know, so that's, um, you know, so that's, you know, something to think about. I see Tim has 3000 topics, robo help project <laughs> that's not getting transformed to another tool anytime soon. My output looks more like the run on the right though. So, <laughs> So yeah, so you know, I mean, thankfully, thankfully, Tim, the tool doesn't matter here, and that's you know, another thing about learning HTML and CSS. All those tools output to that single, um, those single two languages, which are universal around the web. So you know, this is something that you could might be able to do yourself with a little practice and a little time. Um, but again, if you know, if you can. Um, Make your make your stuff attractive for your users, and they'll get engaged with it more, and they'll spend more time with it. Uh, Nina Weiner says, consider the user experience for accessibility. Absolutely, um, lots of people will tell you accessibility is just good content, and it really is. Alt, you know, alt text for your images, uh, you know, hover text for for links, stuff like that. As much as you could do to make. Um, you know, everything access accessible as possible, especially with GDPR and everything that's out there. Um, you know, consider that those things are actually better for all your users. Okay. And the last thing we'll talk about here is, like I mentioned earlier, um, reduce risk. This is something that we can really do. And it's something that I really never thought about until I started at the financial services. Um, you know, one of the biggest things I've learned is that Risk is integral to every decision in financial services, especially at the highest levels. They want to avoid risk as much as possible. Um, it, you know, obviously some things get through, but you know, if you can start at your level to reduce risk, um, it will easily people will easily see the benefits, and especially the higher important people. Um, this is a whole session, and uh, God, what's her name? Um, I just completely blanked on her name. Um, who is really the person here? Oh God, I can't Google this. I, I will come back to you on her name, but she is wonderful. I've seen her talk and she's really, really great. Her book is really good. Um,
but I cannot remember what she said. Uh, I can't remember her name right now, so I apologize. Um, but she uses the word governance, and I use the word governance at work because people understand that. It's not really a dirty word, um, but it might be in your organization. So spin it differently. Ownership, stakeholders. You know, this is really a better uh, long-term value for your company than reducing sport costs because there's only so much you can do to reduce sport costs. You can reduce risk in so many ways with good documentation, good usable documentation that you can prove that users are using and find beneficial. That's really a really good way for you to prove the value of documentation and your and your work as well. So I would really say um, if you can, you know, get that out there. And you know, I'm gonna Google this right now because it's driving me crazy. Uh governance. What the hell is her name? Sorry, what was her name? Uh, Lisa Welchman, that's it, sorry. Lisa Welchman is her name. I apologize for the Google search, but it was driving me crazy. Lisa Welchman is really, really great. She's got a book on governance. Um, and what we did actually, but people really appreciate, and we took some of our metadata from our, data, from our data files and we put them on the page. So you could see when the page was created, when it was last updated, who the subject matter expert was, or the, what we call the content champion. Um, if there was a JIRA ticket, which is our tracking system, if there's a related JIRA ticket, so people can go back and see the source and the genesis of information. So really, you know, we took that risk information and made it a feature and put it front and center so people knew that the content was recent, uh, high quality, and that they could reach out to someone for questions. So those are really just simple things that you could do with the content you already have, and maybe some of the metadata that you already have to kind of say, hey, look, we're reducing risk at the firm, or we're really adding value here and being thoughtful about how the company works and avoiding unpleasant situations. Anybody have any questions about that? Anything you'd like to add? Okay. Well, the good news is my throat's getting sore but we're ready and ready to wrap up. So um, I hope that you found this useful. I hope I didn't talk too quickly. Uh, I see we still have a couple of minutes if you wanna chat um, or ask any questions or wrap up. Um, but really, you know, you could follow me here at edmarsh.com. Um, I'm at edmarsh on Twitter. As I mentioned, content content podcast is at edmarsh.com slash podcast. I should also add that I do the podcast for the LavaCon conference, the content strategy conference. Uh, so you can go to lavacon.org and listen to that there. I'll be continuing to do that this year. Um, and it's really, you know, a way that I added value by putting out my podcast. It added value enough to for an organization to reach out and said, hey, would you like to do ours too? Um, this is my LinkedIn address. This is where uh, I'll post my slides on SlideShare and, of course, content, content info, like I mentioned, dot info, like I mentioned, um, <clears throat> is an aggregator of news for, for our people. Um, and then just to quickly wrap up to toot my own horn a little bit longer since you already listened to me for 45 minutes. Um, I'll be at Interchange, the SDC Interchange Conference. Uh, I'll be presenting at um, conduit again in philadelphia uh, i'll be at summit and i'll be at LavaCon this year um, i may be doing a podcasting 101 session for the uh, stc denver chapter next month uh, still waiting on a confirmation for that but look forward to that as well so um you know if you want to hear me talk some more you've got plenty of opportunity to do it and if you just want to hear me around on twitter you can go to at ed marsh so i hope you find some value in this i really hope um you know, you can go back to your organizations and back to your teams and, um, you know, and, and put some of this to work. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions now or afterwards, uh, really would love to hear from you, Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever, please, uh, please reach out. Uh, I'm, I'm responsive on everything. Um, so, you know, feel free to, to reach out if you have any questions or any follow-ups or stuff like that. So with that, I will uh, take a sip of water and, um, and keep my mouth shut for a second. So we're getting feedback in the chat window. Donna said uh, it was great, filled with great quick tips uh, to spark ideas for helping my company and my professional Ooh. development. So thank you, Ed, for that. And thank you, Donna, for that good feedback. Mm. Um, Nina says, thanks, Ed. Mm -hmm. Marcia says, you have convinced me to use Twitter. All right. Nice. Uh, Jeffrey says, thanks for the great info and ideas. And Marcia says, uh, really useful and entertaining. So Ooh, entertaining. I, I, prom okay. I promised them you would be stellar and you were stellar. So <laughs> nice. thank well, you. Well, um, along those lines, Marcia, awesome. I uh, hope you see you there. Um, but I do have a session on my slide here that I've done a couple of times. I actually did it for this chapter last year about um, 
you know, using social media. So it expands a little bit on some of the stuff that we talked here. I actually stole some of the slides from there. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, but that one goes a little bit more in depth about um, some of the some of the um, some of the things that you could do with social media. Ooh, I like that some of this is immediately actionable. Now yeah. that's pretty cool. That is that's good what I like to hear. Yeah. Nice. Well, if it's okay with you, I'm going to stop the recording and then maybe people will speak. There you go.